MUARC Insights first webinar for 2023. I'm Sean Koppel, I'm from MUARC and I'm delighted to be chairing this webinar today. Before I introduce the webinar and our presenters, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands on which we're all meeting and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today's webinar will focus on key findings from the Vehicle Safety Research Group. Specifically, we're going to hear about the benefits of additional vehicle safety technology for young novice drivers in Australia and New Zealand, as well as the benefits of daytime running lights for reducing casualty crashes. We have two dynamic presenters today, Professor Stuart Newstead and Dr. Angelo D'Elia. So Stuart is the director of MUARC and he leads the center's injury analysis and data team. He's a statistician by training and has developed specific expertise in a wide range of safety research areas with a numerical focus, including safety program evaluation, vehicle safety evaluation monitoring and policy setting and police enforcement programs. Angelo is a research fellow within MUARC's injury analysis and data team and has analytical expertise in road safety program evaluation, vehicle safety research from mass data analysis, and the linkage and analysis of injury databases. So today's presentation will take approximately 45 minutes, after which we'll have time for questions. Speaking of questions, please post them in the Q&A box and I'll share these with Stuart and Angelo at the end of our presentation. And now over to you, Stuart and Angelo. Thanks very much, Sean, and uh, welcome everyone to the webinar today. Got a small technical hitch, not, can't get my slides to move, but I'll uh, try this one. No, oh, there we go. <clears throat> technical hitch over. <clears throat> so today's seminar, I'll start off with um, the first part of the session talking about some of the road safety benefits that uh, some of the key driver assist technologies might provide for novice drivers. And Angelo will do the second half of the sem seminar where we are um, looking at the benefits of daytime running lights in light vehicles in Australasia. And then we'll have some time for some questions and discussion at the end. I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, stakeholders in the Vehicle Safety Research Group. They're a uh, group of largely government agencies across um, Australia and New Zealand who have common interest in uh, key aspects of vehicle safety for improving policy and practice around, uh, around vehicle safety. So without further ado, I'll um, launch into our first topic. So just acknowledge my um, co-author on this work, Laurie Budd, who uh, has done a lot of the analytical work and um, helped design this study with me. She's not able to be with us today, so I'm presenting this largely on her behalf. So why should our advanced driver assist systems in vehicles be particularly helpful for novice drivers? Well, we know from a raft of other research that novice drivers are at much higher risk of being involved in crashes. And that's because they have um, primarily poorly developed hazard perception skills. They have trouble in identifying risks and then responding to them appropriately in the road environment. Because of that, they tend to take uh, a little bit longer in responding to uh, peripheral stimuli and identifying and responding to the dangers uh, identified through those uh, stimuli. And of course, we know they commit more uh, driving errors because of their uh, problems with situational awareness. So these are, these are known deficits that uh, novice drivers have that uh, we think and we had an, an idea that uh, some of the new technologies coming out in our vehicle fleet might be able to assist um, drivers, novice drivers, particularly overcome those known deficits they have. So in acknowledging that, uh, we thought we'd first start with some definitions so you know what we're talking about for the uh, rest of the presentation. So what do we mean by a novice driver? So those... Uh, our definition that we've used in this study are holders of a provisional license that is generally aged between 17 and 22 years. That varies a little bit depending on the jurisdiction you're in based on the, uh, the licensing age. Um, 
but generally in that age group. We've also actually looked at slightly more experienced drivers in some of this work too, the 23 to 25 year olds to see if similar uh, aspects hold. But really in doing this work, we wanted to compare their performance and their benefits from ADAS to more experienced drivers. Now experienced drivers set that we've uh, nominated here are full license holders aged between 35 and 55 years. So people that have really been driving for quite a number of years and have developed those uh, key um, cognitive and uh, physical skills to respond to uh, risks on the road much better. And as I said, our previous research shows that this age group particularly are the ones that had the lowest risk per uh, unit exposure on the road. When we talk about advanced driver assist systems, we really um, limited the analysis in this study to those things that are very commonly available out in the fleet at the moment. So we had a, a sense of realism in talking about the scenarios and the benefits that we might get out of these technologies. And they include electronic stability control, which was uh, mandated in Australia from uh, 2012 onwards. Autonomous emergency braking that is uh, about to be mandated for light vehicles in Australia this year. So uh, electronic stability control, of course, the technology that stops you uh, understeering or oversteering off the road in a critical situation. So primarily about loss of control crashes. Autonomous braking is where the vehicle will brake itself in response to a um, radars and, uh, and cameras sensing uh, likely um, forward obstructions. Uh, lane keep assist systems, active ones that actually help steer the vehicle back in the lane when it, uh, it identifies a um, an inadvertent lane departure, so something is not planned. So when the indicator is not going, you know, the driver is not intending to leave the lane, it will read the lane markings and keep the vehicle within the lane. And it's associated technology, which is lane departure warning, which doesn't actually actively steer the vehicle, but will certainly alert the driver if the vehicle is departing from the lane. So those are the four technologies and particularly the top three, which are commonly available in the light vehicle fleet in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and so are accessible to novice drivers theoretically. So the aim is to uh, actually estimate if we could have novice drivers with these technologies in their cars, what would the benefits be in terms of improving road safety? So I've talked about the three technologies there. And of course, to do that, we're contrasting the novice driver experience with the experience of more experienced drivers in what they can get out of those technologies. The database that underpinned this research was a, a database that has been assembled for the Vehicle Safety Research Group program, which includes uh, crash data from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, over an extended period, the broader database covers 1987 through to uh, currently 2020. But for this project, we uh, looked at a, uh, a period of data from 2013 to 2017, which was um, representative of uh, more modern crash situations. We enhanced that database through a series of VIN decoding and model identification. And then we are actually used uh, data from uh, Redbook, which is a uh, vehicle specifications um, gathering company in Australia and from the right car website in New Zealand to actually add vehicle specifications. So actually identify which vehicles had each ADES technology uh, in the fleet. So firstly, to do this, we have to identify for the technology, what are the specific crash types that these technologies are designed to address? And we did that through um, trawling the literature and evaluation studies of this technology that have been undertaken both in Australia and internationally. So for AEB, there's a, a range of different crash types that are, it addresses depending on the um, generation and specification of that technology. So the most basic systems are designed to avoid other vehicles uh, in the forward path. Some are only up to certain speeds and others up to uh, higher speed ranges. And there's what we call narrow, narrowly sensitive crashes. So basically, um, uh, the technology is designed to mitigate running into other vehicles in front of you, either stopped, parked or, or double parked or whatever. And then there's uh, enhancements of the AEB technology that is designed to address um, running into pedestrians. And uh, more broadly, with greater functionality, some of the newer systems are designed to assist with um, uh, a range of other crash types, which you can see there. So 
more than just running into a vehicle in front of you. They can avoid crashes. They can avoid uh, some fixed object crashes. They can avoid people emerging from side uh, yeah, uh, access in other vehicles. And finally, there's uh, capacity to assist at intersections as well. So um, assisting with uh, stopping the vehicle if you're about to turn in front of an oncoming vehicle, for example. So each of those has been considered in this study. So identifying the crash types that we're addressing is important, as you'll see in a minute. A lane keep assist, it is really about, uh, and lane departure warning where it's been considered, it's about vehicles leaving their um, lane, has to have lane marking, and there has to be no obstructions on the lane marking, like snow or ice covering that lane marking. And uh, designed to address uh, head-on crashes or single vehicle runoff path crashes, and those where there hasn't been intentional overtaking of another vehicle, so not an intentional lane departure. And finally, uh, electronic stability control, which is designed to stop uh, primarily in Australia from the research evidence, single vehicle off-path crashes where the vehicle might be out of control even when it's overtaking, so it uh, results in a uh, departure from the carriageway or, or, or crash with a, uh, another vehicle coming the other way. Once you've defined the crash types, the literature also usually provides you with uh, evidence of the mitigation of those target crash types. And so each of the uh, evaluation studies was trawled to see of, the, of those target crash types identified, what proportion are mitigated in the real world by this technology? And it's never 100%. So for electronic stability control for all vehicles, um, for uh, injury crashes, for example, about a 32% reduction in those runoff road type crashes. A lane keep assist, it's around a 53% uh, a, a reduction in uh, injury crash involvement of those um, lane departure type crashes. And for AEB, the, uh, the relative risks estimates, which you see here, results in about a, a 20, 23 to 27% or 17 to 27% reduction in uh, high severity crashes across the different types that have been involved. So these are critical in assessing where, uh, how much benefit these technologies are um, likely to have for our target crash groups. So what we first want to do is identify, well, how often are they involved in these target crashes? Uh, for these technologies, and secondly, applying the effectiveness estimates we have here from the literature to reduce those crashes to see what overall benefit we get from those technologies for those groups. So let's first, we did this analysis in Australia and New Zealand to see if there's any systematic differences, and there are differences between the fleets and the crash population in the two countries, so we did the analysis separately. So first off, we'll talk about the results we have from the analysis in Australia. So first off, let's see how often are these technologies fitted to vehicles? So here is the, uh, the blue line here is the fitment rate of electronic, the electronic stability control to newly registered vehicles in Australia. And as you can see, the technology started to become prevalent around 2000. And uh, by the time we hit the mandate in um, around uh, 2012, we had close to 100% fitment. But that's for new vehicles. When we look at the age distribution in the fleet generally, we know the average age of a vehicle, a light vehicle in the Australian fleet is about 10, 10 and a half years. But when we look at novice drivers, the average age of vehicles driven by novice drivers is about 12 and a half years. So immediately you can see the effect that that's likely to have on fitment rate of these technologies between those two groups. So from other research, we know novice drivers typically financially constrained, so they're and often given vehicles by their parents or other family members to drive, and they tend to be quite old. And the data certainly backs that up, and that has an influence on the uh, fitment rate of those technologies. So for across the fleet generally, for all drivers in 2023, we can see about um, a bit over, uh, around 85% of all vehicles driven on the road now have stability control fit and fitted. But for novice drivers, that figure is about 65%. So significantly lower proportion of vehicles driven by novice drivers currently have stability control fitted. So immediately we can see they're not getting the benefits because they're driving older vehicles from the fleet. Similarly, we have looked at um, AEB fitment. Now AEB started to become prevalent in the fleet, new vehicles entering the fleet around 2013. 
and has risen steeply until we expect 100, around 100% of new vehicles being fitted around the mandate time this year. But when you look at the fleet as a whole, only about 20% of vehicles on the road now have AEB fitted. And for uh, novice drivers, it's even uh, worse given their older age of vehicles. They're roughly about 5% of vehicles driven by novice drivers currently have AEB fitted. So there's a lot of untapped potential in those technologies, both in the fleet generally, but partic for, particularly for novice drivers uh, that has uh, is yet to be realized over the next 20 years. And similarly for lane keep assist, we're not expecting it to be uh, standard quite as soon, but uh, again, very low fitment rates for novice drivers, much less than that in the fleet more broadly, which is still quite low, which really highlights the point that any new technology we put into the fleet, even where we've got 100% of vehicles new fitted coming into the fleet, it takes another 20 years before the whole fleet benefits from the uh, road safety advantages of that technology. But for novice drivers, that might be even longer, given they're uh, shopping at the older end of the fleet. And when you, in fact, looked at, look even the crashed vehicle fleet, and this is the crashed, um, vehicles crashed in 2017, you can see exactly that mirroring. So of those vehicles crashed in 2017, around 65% of vehicles driven by more experienced drivers had ESC but only about 45% for our, uh, our novice group. And even for our slightly older novice drivers, the 23 to 25, that fitment rate was still well below the fleet average. And similarly, we uh, see for lane departure warning, lane keep assist and AEB, similar smaller fitment rates in the crashed vehicle fleet as well. So it really confirms what we saw from the, um, the whole of fleet data, that those involved in crashes don't have that technology fitted either. And here, when we look at the age of vehicles in crashes, that again confirms that our novice drivers are driving much older vehicles. So our blue bars here are the age of vehicles generally in the fleet for full license holders, experienced drivers um, by the age group of the vehicle. And you can see the gray bars are the novice drivers, much older, um, higher proportion of older vehicles uh, crashed by novice drivers, both in injury crashes and in non-injury crashes where they're available from jurisdictions in Australia. So it really confirms what we've, we've known already. Let's now have a look at the involvement in some of our uh, sensitive or potential crash types that are mitigated by these technologies and look at the uh, relative involvement of novice drivers compared to more experienced drivers. And immediately you can see that <clears throat> the distribution of those crash types is quite different between experienced and novice drivers. So novice drivers are more than twice as likely to be involved in a runoff road crash than a more experienced driver. Similarly, they're overrepresented in primarily rear end crashes that AEB might be effective in mitigating. And they're more often involved in uh, lane departure crashes that might be mitigated by lane keep assist. So immediately from their crash profile, you can see that novice drivers would benefit more from this technology just because of the types of crashes that they're actually involved in. And that's also the same when you look at less serious crashes, so those resulting in either minor injury or, uh, or non-injury. But these are the ones of particular interest where it results in a fatal or serious outcome. So immediately from that, that uh, description here, you can see that uh, ESC is a particularly important for novice drivers given the types of their crashes they're having, probably followed by um, lane keep assist and then AEB. So what we can do is actually look at that uh, differential, overlay our evidence on the effectiveness of these technologies on those crash types to come up with a benefit or relative benefit for each of our, for our novice group compared to our more experienced group. And this is exactly what we've done in this next table. So here, what we can do, when we talk about current fitment, this is the fitment at the time of doing the study. So at the time of doing the study, we're only getting about a 2% crash mitigation from these technologies combined uh, for more experienced drivers. For novice drivers, the, the benefit was slightly higher, but that's coming off a lower base. So you can already see that the benefit, even though there's a lower fitment rate, the higher exposure to key crash types for novice drivers gives them a, a benefit even before fitment rates started to go up. What we did then is look at um, when the fitment rate 
was theoretically 100%, what is the maximum benefit we might get? So you see overall, for all drivers, fitting these technologies is likely to mitigate crashes by an additional 10% once we get to 100 fitment or about 12% in total for non-injury crashes. But for novice drivers, that figure is much higher at 18%. And when we talk about injury crashes or the more serious end of the spectrum, similar story. <clears throat> so the overall benefit of about an 8% crash reduction um, from these technologies for our um, <clears throat> more experienced age group, but 18% for novice drivers. So it shows these technologies will benefit novice drivers much more than they ex will benefit experienced drivers because of the crash, their overexposure in those key crash types. But even um, when we talk about even some of the slightly more experienced novice drivers, that benefit is still up around 16%. And these figures have all been derived assuming that the technology is equally effective for each of these age groups. So it will mitigate their target crash types to the same degree. So again, just because of the greater exposure to the crash types mitigated by te these technologies. Fitting these technologies to novice driver vehicles gives you a commensurately higher um, reduction in road trauma than it does for the, uh, the more experienced population. And if we then put a value on that, so what we might expect based on sort of current crash rates, the, uh, the overall saving, if we could mandate these technologies for all novice drivers would amount to about a $223 million uh, community trauma saving and cost savings across Australia. So well worth investment. But it's interesting actually to compare this. This is a, a th basically a five-year age group. It benefits your crew are almost as high as you get from a 10-year or 20-year band of older drivers. So it again emphasizes the much higher benefit these technologies represent for novice drivers than they do for the more experienced driving population. And if you, in fact, added in people up to 25, the total benefit from these technologies in terms of community trauma cost savings would exceed those from the, uh, the 35 to 55 year old age group, which is, uh, which is quite interesting. Now that, uh, that analysis was done assuming, as I say, that each of these technologies had the same effectiveness in re proportionate effectiveness in reducing the target crash types that have been identified in the literature. The next question, well, is, are these technologies potentially more beneficial in terms of the percentage of the target crash type they will reduce for a, um, <clears throat> for a novice driver? And so what we did is actually redid some of the evaluation studies of the technology effectiveness, looking at an interaction between driver experience level um, and the technology effectiveness in reducing its target crash population. And what we found is that for electronic stability control and lane keep assist, no, the, the, the proportionate reduction in target crashes due to that technology was about the same for novice drivers as for more experienced drivers. It still means that the technology is more effective in reducing road trauma trends for the novice driver for those technologies because they are more often involved in those crash types. But for AEB, the story was different. In fact, AEB was proportionally more effective for a novice driver than it was for a more experienced driver. And this gives the relative risk for that, or essentially the, the relative crash rate for that novice for a novice driver compared to a more experienced driver for, um, for AEB. So for our rear end, fatal and serious rear end crashes, <clears throat> our relative risk was 40. So what it says is there's an additional 60% reduction in the target crash type for a novice driver with AEB than there is for a <clears throat> more experienced driver with AEB. So it absolutely says that AEB is a technology that is really beneficial for a novice driver. And because of those sort of attention and cognitive deficits we see for novice drivers particularly, um, having something that assists them in stopping when something's in front of them is, is particularly beneficial. So if, uh, for example, the, uh, the overall benefit of AEB was, um, I can't remember what it was, I think it was about uh, 20%. For a novice driver, that would mean it's about 32% uh, reduction in the, the, the key crash type for the more serious crash types. 
Interestingly, not so much the minor crash types, but the, the more serious ones, a definite benefit, and that was highly significant too in our analysis. Um, also, the other AEB uh, focus crash type that came out was at intersections too. So AEB is commensurately more beneficial in helping novice drivers avoid uh, forward moving crashes at intersections as well. So additional sort of around 20% reduction in injury crash types for AEB. So very, um, very encouraging technology. And I don't think anyone has, else internationally has actually looked at the relative benefits for different age groups, but certainly AUB is a technology that novice drivers uh, benefit particularly from. So when we add those up with the additional benefits of um, AUB for novice drivers, we then get this uh, estimate of the, um, the crash savings that are likely from each technology. And so for injury crashes, which are a particular focus, ES still is still, ESC is still the most important technology for a novice driver, but AEB becomes the next most important technology for a novice driver to have on their vehicle um, because of uh, the greater benefit of that technology to them, as well as their higher exposure to AEB sensitive crash types as well. And so those two things together. Lane departure warning, certainly not to be snoozed at, but if you're looking for an order of priority, ESC first, followed by AB, followed by lane departure warning slash lane keep assist is, is the technology order we want for novice drivers. And um, But the additional benefits, obviously ESC is rolling out in the fleet now, but there's still a lot more to be had from it. But there's a huge additional benefit to be accrued in the future from novice drivers having these additional two technologies in their vehicles. So what was our conclusion? Um, certainly because of the crash types are involved in, as I said, there's no doubt that uh, these technologies are more beneficial, each of them for novice drivers than a, um, a more experienced driver because they target the types of crashes that novice drivers have more often. But uh, combined with the additional benefit that a novice driver gets out of AEB that, that uh, produces some particularly high benefits for that technology. And that could uh, result in significant trauma savings for the uh, Australian community. We estimate around $313 million a year in total by getting all novice drivers into those cars. So it's certainly the evidence provides support for policy, if not mandating, and that's always a big call because uh, obviously not every novice driver can afford a, a nice new vehicle with all these technologies, but certainly strongly encouraging the fitment of these technologies and working with parents too to advocate for if, if you can afford this for your children, these technologies are really important to put on a, a car for your novice driver, which, for example, if, if, if parents are handing down a car, think about that. Does it have these technologies? Would it be better to trade in and buy a, a newer car with those technologies for them? So it really shows that there, there's strong benefits from thinking about that as policy. And interestingly, if we compare it to the benefits we've estimated out of a high-powered vehicle restriction, for example, these are much better to encourage a novice driver have rather than to keep them out of high-powered vehicles. And of course, if we did that, we'd also get some ancillary benefits for uh, improving um, secondary safety as well, because the vehicles would tend to be a little bit newer. We know there's a lot of untapped potential in improving uh, injury mitigation in crashes for newer vehicles for novice drivers as well. Just briefly, we also did the analysis in New Zealand. Uh, Mike Keel, my colleague from New Zealand, assisted with this one and really found much the same sort of thing. So as we found fine in Australia, novice drivers in New Zealand also drive older vehicles. They also uh, have a different crash um, distribution uh, as well. And um, their, uh, their exposure to different crash types is different. Interestingly, this mirrors the Australian situation where we have uh, a higher proportion of ESC sensitive crashes for novice drivers. New Zealand, the, um, the AEB situation is slightly different because um, they're actually less involved in AEB sensitive crashes in New Zealand for some reason. Not quite sure why that is. I think it's, New Zealand has a very different exposure to, uh, to crash types given much of their trauma, serious trauma particularly, comes from uh, high-speed rural road networks. So that may be why that balances. But it also shows you, you need to look at your specific population to decide what your, um, 
priorities are for vehicle safety technology for different groups as well. So a slight difference in New Zealand, but uh, not, not majorly in some respects. So as in Australia, there's a very low proportion of um, drivers currently driving vehicles equipped with this technology, much lower than in Australia, because there's no, of course, no ESC mandate in New Zealand. So only about 20% of the novice drivers in New Zealand are currently driving vehicles with ESC fitted, but that's only sort of 35% for, uh, for the more experienced population too. And the rates of these other technologies in New Zealand are really quite minimal across the board. And that's partly to do with the, um, the used vehicle import scheme, keeping the age of the New Zealand fleet uh, older generally as well. Um, this is the crash savings we estimate based on current fitment, but more interestingly is the uh, benefit that we might get in 2030 in terms of what is likely to be the fitment rate. And with, at this stage, there's not necessarily mandates coming in for these technologies in New Zealand. But even by 2030, we expect a much greater proportion of the, uh, the, the driving population to have these technologies on board, which will lead to commensurate uh, benefits as we've seen in Australia. So still significant benefits to be had and perhaps more proportionally because they're on a steeper uh, in, input curve in terms of the number of vehicles that are now starting to come into the fleet with these technologies. But overall, the conclusions are the same. Again, for novice drivers, because of their involvement, and particularly in New Zealand, in ESC-sensitive crashes, getting ESC into the vehicles quickly for novice drivers is going to have significant benefit uh, in terms of reducing novice driver road trauma. And I think it, it reinforces the fact that um, quite often we've overlooked, we, we know novice drivers have their experience problems, and we talk about training and licensing in uh, bringing benefits to reducing novice driver trauma. But there's also a huge role, I think, for vehicle choice to play for novice drivers in, in reducing trauma too. Only part of the problem is about training and licensing. A large part of the problem is about the types of vehicles that we're putting novice drivers in and expecting them to survive. So any means at which we can improve the standard of vehicles driven by novice drivers, the greater input impact we're gonna have on road trauma. So that's where I'll leave that one. I think I've done my time. So if people want to follow up, there's a lot more references that you can find on the MUARC website that you can read in detail about these studies and where the evidence around them comes from. So I'd encourage anyone who's interested to, to do that and they'll get much more detail than the short cooks tour I've been able to give you today. I'll now my hand over to Angelo and uh, he can tell you about uh, the next study we did. Thanks very much, Stuart. Yeah, today I'm going to discuss our um, evaluation of the effectiveness of daytime running lights or DRLs and I'd like to acknowledge my co-author Stuart. So daytime running lights are lights on the front of a motor vehicle that automatically switch on when driven and they have the aim of increasing visibility to help other road users see the vehicle during the day. And here we see a couple of examples of LED DRLs on an LDR8 and an A4. So many studies have found that DRLs are effective in reducing daytime multi-vehicle crashes. Uh, a statistical meta-analysis by Olvik back in 2003 that included 25 studies um, evaluating the effect on cars found that the use of DRLs reduces a number of multi-party daytime accidents by around 5 to 15 per cent. And in a later study by Wang in 2008 in the United States, uh, found that DRLs significantly reduced the involvement of SUVs in two vehicle daytime crashes by 5.7 per cent. From an Australian perspective, um, Kearney and Stiles uh, in 2003 concluded that there was this inherent uncertainty about how effective DRLs would be in Australia. Um, environmental conditions in Australia can differ from other parts of the world, um, with Australia being called the sunniest continent on Earth, uh, according to the ABC. So there was also uncertainty with regards to the cost benefit of DRLs. However, the move in recent years towards the LED DRLs, which have a significantly lower running costs, has made this concern somewhat redundant. 
there have been no recent studies broadly examining the real world crash base effectiveness of DRLs that are currently present in the light vehicle fleet. So the aims of this work were to utilise Australian crash data to estimate the impact of DRLs on casualty crash risk, which reflect in the Australian crash population and our local conditions, and also to broadly examine the real-world crash base effectiveness of the DRLs currently present in the light vehicle fleet, which includes the newer type of LED DRLs, which are now commonly fitted on new vehicles by various vehicle manufacturers. So the analysis utilised crash data from New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and Western Australia, and it was for the crash period 2010 to 2017, using vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle crashes which were prepared under the VSRG for the used car safety ratings. And Redbook data was used to identify which vehicle models had DRLs fitted. Um, in terms of the analysis model, a Poisson regression model for count data was used to determine whether DRLs are effective in reducing vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle crashes. We selected multi-vehicle crashes during daylight and also dawn or dusk light conditions. And then we um, used an induced, induced exposure approach um, where rear-end crashes were used as a control, that is, that type of crash type is assumed to be unaffected by the presence of DRLs. So now to the results. Firstly, we looked at the association between DRL fitment and multi-vehicle crashes overall. So it was found that DRL fitment was associated with a highly statistically significant reduction in overall crash risk of 8.8% for non-nighttime multi-vehicle crashes. Uh, the association between DRL fitment and multi-vehicle crashes was also stratified by daylight and dawn or dusk light condition. Um, fitment of DRLs reduces crash risk for multi-vehicle crashes by 7.6% during daylight and 20.3% during dawn or dusk. And the association between DRL fitment and uh, multi-vehicle crashes was also stratified by speed zone. And in this case, Fitment of DRLs reduces crash risk or, um, by 7.7% where the speed zones are less than or equal to 74 kilometres per hour and then higher 13.8% where the speed zones are greater than 75 kilometres per hour. So the studies confirm DRL fitment can reduce the risk of being involved in a non-nighttime multi-vehicle crash where vehicle visibility may be a factor in crash causation. So even with Australia being the sunniest continent on earth, it's apparent that DRLs are a useful addition to a vehicle and a proven road safety countermeasure. It was found that DRLs are particularly effective in reducing crash risks during dawn or dusk and in higher speed zones. So for dawn or dusk, headlights are not necessarily used and visual contrast is poor. And for higher speed, there was a study by Fletcher that found greater underestimations in speed by other drivers uh, due to lower levels of contrast. So for both of these reasons, DRLs may compensate by increasing the contrast of the vehicle in the visual field. So I suppose the point is, as such, there's a, there's a clear advantage for consumers to purchase vehicles that have DRLs fitted, even under conditions. I think the proportion of new vehicles entering the Australian fleet with DRLs fitted as standard um, across all of the variants of the vehicle maker model is only around 62%. So, and given that at least half of the existing fleet doesn't have DRLs fitted, mandating DRLs is still relevant and would accelerate this fitment process. And this would uh, likely lead to reductions in the overall crash risk of the fleet. However, you know, the magnitude of the potential reduction is likely to be smaller on average than the effect of some of the latest uh, primary vehicle safety technologies. And uh, this work has now been published as a, in a peer-reviewed journal, the Journal of Safety uh, Research. And I've just uh, listed some references there. And we'd like to uh, thank you for your participation today.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stuart and Angelo. We have a Q&A box that's chock-a-block, so I'll get straight into it. The first question is for you, Stuart, from James Sue. Stuart, can you please explain why there is a difference in the effectiveness of ESC between passenger vehicles and SUVs shown in one of your tables? Yeah, absolutely. Um, passenger uh, SUVs in the original study we did with um, Jim Scully, we estimated uh, a much greater uh, benefit for ESC in terms of reduction of, uh, of runoff road crashes. And this because naturally high riding vehicles are less stable. So the, uh, the handling characteristics particularly that lead to runoff road crashes like understeer or oversteer, uh, a much more prevalent in a high riding vehicle. Some recent work we did actually looked at um, whether the, um, the fitment of stability control has actually normalized this. And uh, the evidence shows, yeah, that uh, stability control has actually been um, quite effective in bringing the risk associated for runoff road crashes for SUVs or high riding vehicles, or even like commercial vehicles like uh, high riding four wheel drive utes. Uh, in, more in line with passenger vehicles. So it is actually quite an amazing technology and what it brings to assisting with driver control in those in those loss of control type situations. And again, that um, our projections in terms of what the benefits of ESC will be for novice drivers are based on a, um, a sort of an average profile of the vehicle fleet and assume that they'll inherit that average profile. But if, for example, um, novice drivers in the future are more likely to end up in SUVs or high riding vehicles generally, then there may actually be a commensurately higher benefit than we've actually estimated in this study anyway. And that is likely given we know the fleet itself has changed that um, something like 75% of all new vehicle sales are now either SUVs or um, like commercials predominantly being four wheel drive utes. So I think um, it actually bodes even better for the what this technology needs to bring to novice driver safety. I, I would personally, looking at these results, never put a novice driver in a high riding vehicle without ESC. I think it's just a recipe for disaster. So that, that, that would be the, definitely the place to start. If you didn't want to do the whole fleet, just mandate it for those with the higher risk when they don't have ESC fitted. Perfect, thanks, Stuart. Um, I found a question for Angelo. Uh, so great presentation, Angelo and Stuart, and this is from Kelly M. Berger. Thanks very much. With the DR DRLs, did you look at the results stratified by winter versus summer? And also, is it possible to get a copy of the presentations? So I'll just answer that latter one. Yes, uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will share the, uh, the recording with you. And also, if you get in contact with us, I'm, I'm sure that Stuart and Angelo would be happy to share their presentations. Yeah, but certainly um, yeah, it would be interesting to look at um, the data stratified by uh, winter or summer. Um, we didn't do that. Mainly we had our strata by light condition, uh, speed zone, um, but also we looked at different um, jurisdiction um, just to take into account any some confounding effects of um, the states. But I think, um, yeah, short answer, no, we didn't look at um, weather. I think there's a little limit to how far you can start it by the data before the results get a bit thin. Except we sort of did implicitly because the daylight hours will vary between summer and winter and we have classified it according to the daylight. What it means though is there's actually probably commensurately higher benefits of DRLs in summer where you've got longer daylight hours to needing to provide that contrast. The benefit would be less in winter where you've got the headlights on more often because it's darker. Okay, another question from Karen Menzies. This, this one's for you, Stuart. Based on this evidence and research, will insurance companies reduce rates to insure younger drivers if they have this technology fit in their vehicle? That's, a, that's an excellent question, actually, because the evidence shows that there should be substantial insurance reductions for novice drivers with that technology fitted in their vehicle. One of the things I think is problematic, though, is that um, from other research we've done, we know novice drivers often don't own the cars. They're not actually registered to them. They're registered to their parents. So being able to, I think, and this may be a real benefit for parents too, being able to nominate their driver for small, much more additional cost, their novice driver on their insurance policy may actually have good benefits for the novice driver 
um, getting an insurance history as well, as long as they're driving that car fitted with the technology. Because, say, if you try and rent, uh, insure a car for a novice driver in their name now, it's almost prohibitively expensive. So, so many parents actually keep the car in their ownership, have the insurance in their name, but let the novice drivers drive it without telling the insurance company. And so I think it would be actually quite beneficial for the insurance companies to say, yeah, you can rent, you can insure this car for your novice driver at a much cheaper rate, and you might actually encourage them to engage with the insurance industry. I, I, and I think it's possibly where the insurance industry hasn't quite got the actuarial measures around um, the benefits of this technology because they're not being able to associate the vehicle with the novice driver necessarily. But that's, that's a really good point, and I think it's something that would be worth um, pushing because it might actually uh, assist with reducing cost of insurance, which might encourage people to buy safer cars too. Thanks, Stuart. Okay, I've got a great question from Muak alum Sujani for Angelo. Angelo, how did you exclude speed-related crashes when looking at the effectiveness of daylight, daytime running lights uh, where the lights would not have made a difference? Yeah, um, well, I think um, firstly, it's really hard to identify um, crashes where speed is a factor from the crash data that we utilised. Um, so we didn't sort of explicitly eliminate that, but certainly um, in terms of the induced exposure um, methodology, um, I think um, by um, um, choosing, I mean, sensitive, uh, crashes sensitive to DRL tech as opposed to crashes that aren't, we adjust for various other non-DRL factors in the, in the analysis. And so that's one way to account for other factors in, in addition to things like driver uh, characteristics and, and whatnot. So I think the analysis design, as far as we can, adjusts for other, other factors. So I think the estimates you're getting will be sort of average across whatever speed profile was, was in the data we had. It might be an interesting future question to look at actually, is that whether when there's actually speeding involved, if we can even vaguely reliably identify the speed related crashes in the data to see whether there actually might be greater effectiveness for DRLs in that circumstance where speed perception becomes an issue, particularly, and that might be particularly the case for older people who have a lot of problem with speed perception, whether that would actually assist in that. Mm. Okay, so I've got another question for Stuart from Mo. Is there a similar study that's been conducted for the for the heavy vehicle industry or for bucks, uh, buses or trucks? Uh, the answer is no. And one of the reasons why is because we have a lot of difficulty actually knowing whether heavy vehicles are fitted with uh, various technologies because unlike the light vehicle fleet where we have very standard specification of vehicle and so we can look up red book and say this car had these features many heavy vehicles are essentially uh, custom specified and there's nothing on vehicle registers or in any other available information that tells us this truck had esc or this truck had roll stability control or anything else but i suspect the same sort of things that we're seeing in the light vehicle fleet may even be amplified in the heavy vehicle fleet where issues of being sympathetic to vehicle handling become more acute. So I would expect that uh, these results would also apply to heavy vehicles and maybe more so, but unfortunately we currently don't have the data systems to allow us to investigate it explicitly. So I am unfortunately can't give you a firm answer, Mo, but I would expect the answer is um, a similar benefit would be derived if not more. Thanks, Stuart. Um, just to another one, um, do you have, this is from Merrin, do you have concerns about novice drivers learning to drive in cars with the technology and not learning driving skills that promote safe driving? Uh, yeah, I think that is actually a real issue and I think it's, it's a good question to bring up. I know from my personal experience, having taken a couple of novice drivers through, they become very reliant on some of the technologies um, particularly those associated with parking, I can say, <laughs> to help them uh, with, with some of those key skills. Um, I, I think it may be, the, may be a problem, but I'm not sure necessarily because a lot of the time when you're driving normally, you're not actually, or you, you're being taught to drive in a regular manner, you're not actually drawing on those technologies um, day to day. So you're not activating the stability control or the AEB system all the time when you're learning to drive as a novice driver, or hopefully you're not anyway together. Uh, proverbial out of the, uh, the assistant driver, if you were. But um, so I, I think it's probably unlikely. What it does is, and these, these are the best vehicle safety 
technologies you have are the ones that operate sort of seamlessly in the background and only come to the fore when you need it. But otherwise, you're um, you're actually supposedly in control of the vehicle to the best of your ability. So my, my gut feeling is that we haven't looked at this, but I suspect um, it wouldn't because hopefully they're not being taught in a way to drive that relies on those technologies regularly. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Stuart. And as a behavioralist, I, I would confirm that. Um, so this one's for Angelo. Uh, would, would there be a confounding factor of the types of vehicles that had DRL? For example, the age of the vehicle or ones that are at the higher end of the market? Yeah, yeah certainly um, in terms of the data that we've utilised, we've limited the um, year of manufacture to 2010 plus to um, make sure we've generally captured the um, newer types of vehicles. So that sort of um, helps to address um, including older vehicles that may not have that sort of technology in, in the analysis. So. And Angela, I'll come back to you. Um, this is from James. Is your study applicable for different vehicle types such as trucks and motorcycles in terms of benefits? Yeah, I think, um, firstly, I have seen some questions around motorcycles. Firstly, the we um, the database we use is based on used car safety rating. So only includes live vehicles, that is um, passenger cars and like commercial vehicles, doesn't include motorcyclists. Um, and then there's also, there's always that question about whether DRLs are, um, help with um, visibility around motorcyclists. And certainly, we didn't um, look at um, motorcycle crashes in this analysis, but certainly something we could we could expand this analysis to consider um, um, their old thicknesses as it, as it relates to motorcycles. So it's something that perhaps it's something we could do further to this. Yeah, again, we don't have the, the specification data for motorcycles isn't as good. But uh, you can imagine that if it's an issue of overcoming um, visual contrast problems, the DRLs would be particularly beneficial for motorcyclists, possibly more so. And, particularly acknowledging that motorcycles are smaller um, to, to pop out in your periphery and um, they also tend to be uh, predominantly dark colours as well. So there may be a benefit. And if you remember, there used to be a mandate for uh, headlights on for motorcycles that was, uh, was repealed. So with the advent of uh, de um, particularly LED technology, there may be a, a significant benefit in considering putting it back on the motorcycles. Okay, Stuart, over to you. So this is from Teresa, probably uh, one of Australia's or internationally um, experts on young novice drivers. She would like to know, um, so young novice drivers were defined as provisionally licensed and or aged 17 to 22. Was there an age cap for the provisional drivers? Uh, an age cap, yeah. So um, the, they had to be under 22 and provisional drivers. So it was not one or the other, it was actually both. So they had to be they had to be novices because on occasions in some of the uh, older jurisdictions you could have someone who was twenty two and offer provisional license, but um, not so common in most jurisdictions now. So they're one and the same. What we didn't consider is provisional license holders who are older than twenty two. So there may actually be benefits for them as well, but um, they're a bit harder to pick out and uh, a bit more scarce in the analysis. You might need to control for them differently. And as as you would know, Teresa, the um, we, we ascertain that their um, cognitive development by the time they hit 25 is different. So even if they are a provisional driver, you might get a different result from as well, which is why a lot of the graduated licensing um, provisions come off at 25, even if you're getting a license for the first time. Mm -hmm. And probably the last question, I'll give this one to Angelo. Um, in terms of the effectiveness, could the colour of a vehicle um, be considered a potential contributing factor? For example, a small grey hatchback versus a large white SUV? Uh, yeah, and I see there's questions around, you know, whether DRLs could be as effective for lighter colour cars as darker cars. And, of course, um, that brings us back to the car colour study that um, Stuart and I undertook in 2010. And I think that... Um, It'd be interesting to see whether DRLs have an effect on those results because certainly um, darker colour cars um, have a higher crash risk compared to uh, lighter colour cars because of that visual contrast. And I think um, DRLs would certainly um, have to compensate for, for that somewhat. So that's, maybe that's a reverse answer, but um, certainly, um, yeah, it helps with visual um, contrast. So 
It's interesting too that the um, the difference in um, crash risk associated with colour from our earlier study was about the same magnitude as the benefit you get from the DRLs as well. So, I don't know if that's coincidence or whether it would actually confirm that as a uh, as an issue. Wonderful. So that brings us to the end of our webinar. I'd really like to thank our two presenters, Stuart and Angelo, who spoke so eloquently about this topic. And I'd like to thank all of you online here for taking the time to attend our webinar. We're looking forward to hosting more MUARC Insight webinars throughout the year, and we'd be really keen to hear from you if you have topics or research areas that you would like to hear more about. So thanks again and have a great day. Bye.